also underestimate how much we can do if we take rest seriously. I enjoy both good work and good rest. I love intellectual and physical challenges, the sense of purpose and accomplishment that comes from getting both big and little things done. For me, the feeling that accompanies a creative breakthrough, and even just the feeling of chasing an idea, immersing myself in a problem and matching my talents against a big challenge, is as addicting and exciting as any game as physically satisfying and stimulating as food, and I really like food, as emotionally fulfilling and essential as being in love. Hard work can be both honorable and rewarding. I look back fondly on some of my hardest jobs because of the camaraderie I found working long hours with good people, pushing the boundaries of our company and trying new things. I find visions of the good life that feature wealth creation systems and early retirement, crass and distasteful. In contrast, the arguments of psychologists like Viktor Frankl and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi that the good life is defined by a search for meaning and an abundance of challenges make profound intuitive sense. So my interest in rest doesn't arise from a distaste for work. It starts with a sense that we should embrace challenges, not avoid them. That work isn't a bad thing, but an absolute necessity for a meaningful, fulfilling life. But I've also come to see our respect for overwork as, perhaps a bit paradoxically, intellectually lazy. Measuring time is literally the easiest way to assess someone's dedication and productivity, but it's also very unreliable. At the same time, I love serious rest. Not idle hours watching Russian dashboard cam videos and taking Facebook quizzes to see which Twilight character I am, but beautifully empty hours that stretch out untouchable by clients or colleagues or especially children. I love sleeping, the physical sensation of my body settling into bed, of unconsciousness rising like the moon. I'm motivated to finish my work by the prospect of an hour at the gym. Of course, I can't claim any special insight here. The ancient Greeks saw rest as a great gift, as the pinnacle of civilized life. The Roman Stoics argued that you cannot have a good life without good work. Indeed, virtually every ancient society recognized that both work and rest were necessary for a good life. One provided the means to live, the other gave meaning to life. Today, we've lost touch with that wisdom, and our lives are poorer and less fulfilling as a result. It's time we rediscover the good that rest can do. While I've had an interest in the psychology of creativity since college, I only began thinking seriously about the role of rest in creative lives more recently. Specifically, during a winter evening I spent with my wife at a cafe in Cambridge, England. I was a visiting fellow at Microsoft Research, working on a project that eventually turned into my book, The Distraction Addiction. We would often go to one of the town's many cafes or pubs after dinner. On this evening... We settled at a table with a stack of articles and two books I was reading, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own and John Kay's Obliquity. In A Room of One's Own, Woolf compares the lives of dons at well-endowed ancient colleges and the pinched existence of faculty at the newer women's colleges. The ancient colleges offered far greater opportunities to excel, according to Woolf, not because of their richer endowments, but because of their more leisurely pace. Generous research budgets and obliging staffs gave faculty time for long walks and lengthy conversations. Meanwhile, in obliquity, John Kay observes that companies that flourished when they focused on great work and customer service often stumble when new executive teams institute strategies focused on improving financial performance. Companies that put profits first, Kay argues, are more likely to lose money than those that treat profit as a byproduct of doing great work. These two books triggered an insight about a third that I had been carrying around like a good luck charm, hoping that some of the success the author enjoyed during his time in Cambridge might rub off on me. The Double Helix, James Watson's account of his and Francis Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA. Usually I focused on the competition and conflict in the story, but Wolf's argument that leisure enables productivity and Kay's idea of obliquity made me aware of something I'd never paid much attention to.